state of affairs. Yeah, so we are really fortunate, though, to, to have her here over Zoom to, to give her presentation. Um, and I think in the interest of time, Anastasia, I'll go ahead and just pass things over to you. Um, maybe you can say something. We can make sure the volume is working okay. Again, sorry. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Can you all hear that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for allowing me to present uh, remotely. I have some different issues. Uh, and uh, uh, in this talk, I want to talk about conversions of gradient descent with linearly correlated noise and applications to differentially private learning, which we did together with Ryan, uh, Zachary, Keith, and Brandon. Uh, our work is motivated by privacy. So, uh, as you saw yesterday, uh, privacy, uh, like uh, in uh, as, uh, in collaborative learning, privacy is an issue, and uh, frequently we want to do collaborative learning in settings when the data sets, like when the data are quite sensitive, and it's good, uh, it, like it needs some privacy protections. And one of the ways how to ensure privacy is to use uh, differentially private HTTP. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna uh, uh, give a, like uh, a good overview. I think you saw it yesterday, and uh, I will just give a simple, uh, simplified version of how, like, a simplified description of how it works uh, for the purpose of this talk. And uh, yeah, so, so in differentially private HTT, so we have some clients, and uh, these clients we compute, like, uh, so, yeah. So how does it work? We start from some uh, model X. So this is our parameters uh, that we want to learn, and uh, uh, like uh, like these clients or like nodes, we start to compute gradients on the local data sets, uh, like CI. Uh, so these are like some mini batch gradients. When we click these gradients, uh, when uh, some aggregation of this gradient happens in some ways, and uh, uh, like uh, for example, secure aggregation. And uh, to this uh, like aggregated gradient, uh, like some noise, some privacy noise is uh, getting added uh, to ensure uh, that uh, the gradients are private. <coughs> uh, like to hide some information of, of uh, like these gradients. And then, so this prioritized gradient gets applied to the iterates with some step size, and this procedure continues. And uh, it could be summarized uh, quickly, like um, like in a short way. Uh, so at every iteration, we just apply some uh, like aggregate gradients with some noise. And uh, 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 like as you saw yesterday in Peter's talk, uh, in uh, like uh, if we want to apply like uh, if in collaborative learning or iterative learning, uh, so like uh, like like frequently, uh, like in order to ensure that this noise is small. Uh, we would need to use some amplification techniques, uh, and this, this is called amplified uh, DPHD. And this amplification techniques, uh, like for example, amplification by sampling, it requires that all the clients are available at all the time because, uh, like, we need to be able at every iteration, we want to do sampling, and we want to sample every client with non zero probability, which is not, uh, like, so practical in practice, this is not what happens. And uh, we could use unamplified DPHD, and the noise that we add at the iteration would be large, would have large magnitude. And uh, so Peter told about it yesterday. So we proposed this uh, DPFTRL uh, style of algorithms that don't use any amplification techniques, and uh, we correlate uh, noise over iteration in such a way with uh, as the, like the last iteration. So the noise, yeah, like here, like maybe um, I should repeat. In these uh, algorithms, at every iteration, the noise is IID and it's uh, independent from the previous noise. And in this uh, like algorithm, uh, the noise is correlated over iterations, and uh, it's correlated in such a way that in the last iteration, like some part of the noise before got uh, removed. Uh, and so we showed that for like uh, fixed privacy level, like epsilon is like some privacy parameter, uh, this uh, like. Uh, this algorithm can achieve uh, better performance than with unamplified PhD and sometimes even better than amplified PhD. And uh, uh, the question, uh, uh, yeah, and so, so let's look uh, in more detail how this algorithm looks like. Uh, so, like, 
just to remind, uh, DPHD, at every iteration, like add some gradients and add, add uh, uncorrelated noise. So the T here is uncorrelated noise at every iteration. <coughs> and uh, uh, in DPHTRL, this noise at T is getting correlated with some coefficients, uh, like given by this correlation not B. And uh, like we would need to scale this uh, by some sensitivity parameter uh, in order to ensure what the privacy is the same. And so, like in this form, in, like if we have the algorithm in this form, uh, for any correlation pattern B, we would have exactly the same privacy. Uh, and with sensitivity, how to compute it, uh, like it was done in these papers, I'm not going to focus uh, here on, on, on this question. Uh, and the question is so, like we have like this correlation patterns B, but uh, all of them may give the same privacy, and which one should we use to get the best optimization? So that's the question uh, we want to study. Um, and uh, how prior, like how this works? How did we do it? We have uh, some convergence upper bound, and uh, like we have some parameter phi of B. Uh, um, uh, which, uh, yeah, like, like so some function of B, which we minimize, and uh, this is how we get, uh, like, like we, we uh, take these correlated schedules, BMF, uh, like, as the ones that minimize this upper bound, uh, like, uh, like convergence upper bound. So, like, if we minimize convergence upper bound, we will get uh, uh, noise schedules that, get, uh, that leads to the faster uh, performance. Um, and the problem with this is only in this convergence rate is what this convergence rate is not tight and it doesn't recover uh, convergence in some special cases. For example, if B gives uncorrelated pattern, just classical DPHD, uh, this convergence rate would not recover uh, like the best convergence rate of, of uh, HD in this case. And so in, in this work, we studied uh, the question uh, how the uh, like, how this correlation patterns B affect optimization, and we derive the tighter convergence rates that capture tightly some important special cases. And uh, so, and it depends on some like different like different function phi tau. Uh, and uh, this tau is uh, is like some hyperparameter. So uh, like uh, we have some extra hyperparameter, and this tau uh, measures uh, how like how many iterations, uh, like between how many iterations, correlations are still matter. And after, like, after tau iterations, if you added some noise before, it uh, effectively uncorrelated. Uh, and uh, based on our new uh, convergence rate, we introduce uh, noise schedules that minimize our uh, uh, new convergence rate. And uh, we <coughs> Estimated within practice on sci far time data set, and uh, we see what for all uh, like parameter, like privacy parameters epsilon, our proposed uh, MF plus uh, improves uh, uh, consistently uh, over previous DP MF, like DPFTRL. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so now we wanted also to understand, uh, like, on simple like function on simple but in simple setting in simple quadratic function, why do we have such improvement like very consistent, and uh, so what we plotted uh, uh, is average error. So this is what we analyzed in theory. This is for what we gave convergence rates, uh, and like we run different learning rates, uh, and uh, like we plot these uh, two different methods, and. Uh, um, we see what uh, for like our new like our uh, DPM of plus, it uh, like uh, consistently either same or better. Uh, like we have either same or better uh, loss, uh, which which is consistent with the theory. Uh, however, in practice, what we used in like usually uh, we never use every iterate. We use usually the last iterate and uh, especially in differential privacy. Uh, and we see what interesting really uh, for the last iterate performance. Uh, DPMF plus improves even more, some, and sometimes improves for learning rates where uh, average uh, iterate is not improved, like, for example, here. Uh, and so we also uh, like studied uh, like some conversion behavior, and we see like very interesting behavior with uh, like every tau iterate, like 
tau is our like correlation parameter, and uh, here we put tau equal to 50. We see that every tau iteration loss, uh, like, like I don't know, so loss consistently uh, decreases, uh, and uh, so this is this is ensures that the last iterate also increases, or also is, is better. So the last uh, error is good, and uh, so this raises like a lot of like this raises, raises interesting question about analyzing this type of algorithms in terms of last iterate behavior. Uh, okay, and to summarize, uh, so we type the like we more tightly analyze conversion behavior under correlated noise patterns. We proposed the new noise schedules based on our theory, and uh, <coughs> we observed an interesting behavior where the last like iterate be, like um, conversions is improved, so the noise uh, is decreased, and it would be interesting to study why it happened. <coughs> Thank you very much. Any questions for Anastasia? One quick, I just wanted to clarify one thing. So you mentioned the tighter convergence uh, behavior in special cases. Are the special cases specifically these cases with correlated noises where you have a specific parameter tau there for the delay? Or what were the special cases where you get improvements? Yeah, so special cases, what we considered is when uh, we have uh, like, like uncorrelated noise. So B can be any correlation pattern, right? And you could have uncorrelated noise. So it would be the same uh, as DPHD. And uh, in our like, correlated pattern we used is that we add, like, at every next iteration, we would exactly subtract all the noise that we added at previous iterations. So we, have, we would have here the T plus one minus the T, or okay. the T minus the T minus one. OK, OK, got it. OK, great. I think we'll have, um, next we have Peter Iktarik from, from KAUST giving a talk. So let's thank Anastasia again. Thanks a lot for having me. So I'll talk about something which, uh, which Nadi already uh, alluded to a little bit about the strength of local training to do something nice for us in fair learning. And the stuff I actually mentioned is that local training is probably a communication ac acceleration mechanism. And I have special slide which I managed to prepare just for Nadi based on what I saw on his slides. So this is the, uh, this is the optimal method in the homogeneous and heterogeneous case, uh, which also beats uh, mini batch SGD in, in, in the setup where uh, these uh, distributed, these parallel uh, workers have different uh, times of, uh, of uh, computation. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about this, so this is just a very, very, very quick, uh, very quick uh, planet today. It's a recent work of us. This is Kaust, uh, the collaborators for the line of work that uh, motivated this, this talk. Most of our members or former members of my team, but there's also some other people in here. All right, so let's start with what is local training. Uh, I only have a couple slides on this just to get everybody on the same page. Uh, in order to be able to do that, let's formalize what we mean by uh, optimization or failure learning in this case. So we want to be minimizing the average over a certain number of clients. Uh, we are uh, uh, working with d-dimensional vectors. This is uh, parametrizing the, the model that we'll train. And these uh, functions could be expectations over some distributions, which are allowed to be arbitrarily different. I'm not going to be making any assumptions on any 
kind of similarity between these functions. However, I will uh, talk about uh, the smooth and strongly convex case in the entire talk. I'm leaving out convex or non-convex cases just outside, outside of this because even in this case, we didn't know until very recently what local training really does. So this is really why I'm focusing on that. Okay, but I want to stress again, no assumption on data similarity. So what is uh, the dumbest possible algorithm can think of to solve this problem? It's great in the sense. Of course, it's dumb, but it's smart in, in the way that it can be improved in many ways to make it into a very, very good algorithm later on. So let's work with three workers at the moment. Uh, the way gradient descent could be implemented is this very simple uh, uh, algorithm here. Uh, XT is received by the server, uh, by, uh, from, from the server by all workers. A local copy of this XT is created. Every client takes a gradient step based on their local data and local function. That's why there's F3 here, F2 here, and F1 over there. After this, the model is uh, communicated to the server. Server just averages these models. And this just happens to be, if you do the algebra, just one gradient descent step. Everything is fine. What is problematic with this method? What is problematic is that these six arrows are very expensive. And uh, compared to the computation time, the communication time is typically much, much more expensive. So this looks like a very badly designed method because you spend much more time on communication than computation. So how can this be improved? So the, the very simple idea, which people had roughly, let's say 10 years ago, or could be even 25 years ago, depend, depending how you count, is just use more local training. So this is what I call by local training. Uh, don't just stop at one gradient step, just keep going. So the second worker keeps taking gradient steps with respect to its own uh, local data, F2, until, let's say, capital K local training steps happen. In this case, these are gradient descent steps. And then the resulting models are communicated, server averages them, and broadcasts uh, the model to everybody in the process is repeated. So the question is, what K should we choose? Clearly, we shouldn't choose K is equal to 1 because we get gradient descent. I already said gradient descent is not a good method. If you go to K infinity, there's also a bad uh, choice because then the method only can find the average of the minimizers of these functions, which is not going to be the minimizer of the average. But, but uh, practically, some k which is reasonably uh, chosen is much better uh, uh, than just choosing k is equal to 1, and the question is why. So here in this paper, um, in this paper, uh, we outline uh, five generations of local training methods in the smooth, strongly convex setting based on uh, the, the theoretical understanding of local training that we had at that time. So the first generation dates back to uh, roughly 10 years ago to this work and, and these other works by uh, Philip Moritz and co-authors or Brandon McMahon. This is one of these early federal learning papers where uh, these authors realize just choosing K bigger than one and they've done it in the, in, in the setup of SGD, not necessarily great in the sense, but as I said, even great in the sense, uh, setting is uh, not understood. They realize they can uh, speed up the communication by factors of between 10 to 100. So the effect is really huge. Choosing K different from one is really huge. However, there was no theory. So we didn't know at that point in time whether this actually is just a fluke or it's a real phenomenon that can be studied. And this is what you would see uh, if you look at uh, local SGD or local gradient descent in this case, what you would see roughly is that compared to gradient descent, which is, which is this blue line, if you take more than one local training steps, you get much faster convergence initially, but the method also uh, gets stuck near some, uh, in some neighborhood of the solution much sooner. So depending on the accuracy that you're aiming for, certain number of local training steps could be better than some other number of local training sets. However, we don't understand at least two things on this plot, theoretically, which is there's no theory which explains why these, uh, these lines should be better than gradient descent. All theory uh, later on in generation two and, and, and forward, where generation one now, uh, says that uh, the slope should not be better than that of gradient descent. And also we're not happy with these uh, methods getting stuck. So what the subsequent generations were trying to resolve is these two issues. Okay, so the first uh, generation of uh, our of theoretical understanding uh, relied on this very simple intuition, which is if all the functions are homogeneous, are the same, which is the, the setup that Nati was focusing on in, in, in some of his talk, then clearly taking local 
steps should be beneficial in the setup of full uh, gradient computations, right? Because, uh, um, because then you should just take infinitely uh, many local training steps. Everybody's trying to solve the same problem. You don't have to communicate at all and everything is fine. So that's better than taking one local gradient step. So, so you would do some sort of sensitivity analysis on this. So for instance, with this bounded gradient diversity uh, inequality or assumption, one would say if C is one, you, you think of these uh, local data sets as being identical. If C goes to infinity, you allow more and more heterogeneity, but you're going to pay for the heterogeneity. And the results in these papers, which I'm not really mentioning here, they deteriorate uh, quickly as the level of heterogeneity goes to arbitrary heterogeneity. And then you get nonsensical results saying that local training should not help at all. However, that is not what practitioners observed in practice. Local training would help even with arbitrary levels of heterogeneity. So these kinds of results were not satisfying for that reason. Then uh, the second, the third generation is the generation where no assumptions on uh, any level of uh, uh, homogeneity or bounded heterogeneity were made. So uh, with Ahmed Khaled and Konstantin Mishenko, we managed to prove that local gradient descent actually converges. It converges, however, at the worst rate than gradient descent. Okay, so that is very disappointing, but we didn't need uh, any assumptions on homogeneity. So it does really work, it's not a heuristic, however, it's the worst method. So this clearly, again, is not answering the question why local gradient descent is better because, uh, in, because it says it's worse, but in practice it's better. So that's not satisfying. The fourth generation of methods, which was started by size work and, and, and co-authors, um, uh, the scaffold paper and there's some other works from, from my lab and, and subsequent works of other people. I, I even ca I can't read this uh, on here. Uh, they uh, removed the, 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 the neighborhood uh, convergence uh, uh, by throwing in some uh, drift reduction mechanism. Um, so what happens here that you get the same rate of gradient descent, not faster than gradient descent, but uh, compared to the generation uh, before, generation three, which gets stuck around some uh, neighbor in some neighborhood of the solution, generation four just keeps going and you get a linear convergence rate, what you would expect uh, under L-smooth and, and strongly convex setup. Okay, so that is all fine. However, the rate is still not better than gradient descent. So this theory would tell you, just don't take more uh, local gradient steps. Or if you take thousand local gradient steps, make every local, uh, make every step size thousand times smaller than the gradient descent step size. And then uh, that's how you should run the method. That, that's, that's what the, the theory predicted. And that's why uh, the theory says you get the same performance in, as gradient descent. So this is the best we knew at that time. However, it's still not fully satisfying because uh, obviously the method is better than this in practice by a huge margin. So we still were missing something very fundamental. So this brings us to the uh, fifth generation of local training methods where uh, well, we could prove that in fact what's happening is that this is not just a fluke, it's not just coincidence that local training helps. You can prove it and what's really happening is that you go from condition number dependence to square root of condition number dependence just like with uh, Polyag or Nestor of acceleration under suitable assumptions. So this is really what, what local training does if it's executed in the right way. All right, so this is the uh, paper where we managed to show this. And if you, if you can read the title, there's three exclamation marks in the title. We're thinking about this for quite some time. And so we're happy that we could, we could uh, resolve this. So the formal theorem looks something like this. I'll go very quickly through it. If the number of iterations, which is communication, uh, these are iterations, not communications, iterations, is at least condition number, and max of condition number and one over p squared, which, where p is going to be the probability of communication. And it can be anything between uh, zero and one times log one over epsilon. Then certainly Lyapunov function uh, gets uh, pushed below epsilon. The Lyapunov function involves the convergence to the optimal solution, which is necessarily unique because we assume strong convexity. And these are some kind of dual control variates uh, for drift reduction. So, so they also converge to optimal dual variable. Now, if you just look at this result, you would see that choosing P being uh, one is definitely not a good idea. And P being one would mean you communicate in every single iteration. That would mean you just take one local gradient step and then you communicate average. One local gradient step, uh, you uh, average, which means with P is equal to one, you get just gradient descent as a special case of this. But if L over mu is huge, then P being equal to one is definitely not going to 
be the bottleneck in this max. So you should choose one over P squared exactly matching L over mu. And this gives you the optimal formula for P. And the optimal P should be one over the square root of condition number. And that means that you should really take square root of condition number local training steps. That's the optimal number of local training steps. And with this, you only get square root of condition number communication rounds. Because together, you still get square root of condition number times square root of condition number uh, gradient steps, which is just L over mu gradient steps. So this is really what's going on. And this uh, is just, uh, this is a more general result which works for any proximal optimization uh, setup where you want to minimize the sum of a smooth, uh, strongly convex function and the proximal regularizer. And what we're really doing here with this probability P, we're skipping the computation of the proximity operator. So what is really behind this, it's a variance reduction mechanism for compressing the proximity operator in a forward backward uh, algorithm. This is what's really behind this, even though I don't have time to really go into this uh, at any depth. Okay, so, uh, so this was the first paper. And then we're uh, inspired by this and, and we started asking uh, follow up questions. Can we combine this with this or this or this or this trick and so on. So we, so we were quite busy over the last uh, year and a half with this. This is work by some other people. And uh, one of the last slides that I want to show here, uh, depending on how much time I have left is this. Uh, so we started asking questions such as let's say, can we throw in client sampling into the equation and can we still retain the uh, accelerated communication nature of local training. With Proxy, we couldn't do it. We tried very hard and we couldn't do it. Uh, however, we came up with a different algorithm, which we call 5GCS. This is the fifth generation client sampling uh, method, which could combine probably uh, client sampling with accelerated local training so that you would get the kind of rate that you'd expect. And very recently, we managed to also do this for Proxy. And in this Tamuna algorithm, we can do client sampling also for Proxy. So then you could ask question, can you combine this with communication compression in such a way that you get theoretically better communication complexity? So there's all this parallel stream of works on reducing communication complexity by compressing the communicated messages, not through local training. And I can give a separate talk on this and we've done a lot of work in the direction as well. So this was the first time we're able to show that local training plus communication compression can be combined. And you can get the method which is up to minimum square root of D, square root of N, and square root of condition number better than if you don't compress the messages. So, so D is the dimensionality, N is the number of clients, and, and kappa is the condition number. So a minimum of these three square root of numbers, you can improve this rate if you do communication compression. So this all, these methods support the centralized setup, which, uh, which uh, relates back to Natus uh, talk about uh, optimization over uh, connected graphs. So you can do this on connected graphs as well. These are not time varying graphs, but these are static graphs. And, uh, and some of these methods actually support any local training methods, such as this one uh, and this one. These other ones support GD or SGD or some various and just SGD. I don't know how much time I have left, but this was my uh, last slide in the end right here. Perfect, well, yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, I have a quick question and we can see if other folks have questions as well. So one question I have for you, I think you have some work on this, is, is what degree, you know, part of the, I think, excitement around using something like federated averaging in a cross-device setting is when you're solving these deep learning objectives and you see a lot of improvements in practice. Do you, to, to what degree do you think that that is in terms of that being useful for solving the optimization objective versus there being something useful in terms of generalization when using this? So I really think it's both. And uh, here we purely focus on the communication acceleration aspect of this, not at all looking at non-convex setup or generalization. But uh, uh, there are some earlier works, even from my lab, where we showed that uh, local training could be also interpreted as some sort of personalization. And when you do personalization, you might hope for more generalization. Still the uh, fundamental uh, assumptions there are not quite, it's not, not quite clear what the goal of fair learning and setup would really be, but under those assumptions it all works out even theoretically. And uh, so we have also a recent paper where we combine all of this with personalization and personalization adds yet another acceleration and mechanism into all of this. Interesting. Okay. Are there any other questions from folks? Yeah, Zach. Uh, you have slides way back about yep. kind of like how 
doing multiple sets of local already uh, right. had this kind of like sharp slope followed by a plateau. Right. Um, and you mentioned that, uh, I, well, so I think you have some work that kind of explains this in some settings, like in certain strongly conduct settings, for instance, like you can get some kind of like effective Lipschitz constant that explains that behavior. But has any of your research? Yeah, so there's some, there's some early, there's some early works, even mine, which I have ignored, I didn't quite mention. Okay. So you could partially maybe explain some of this, even without getting into the square root. But the square root really goes to the heart of the matter because that effect is just much larger. Got it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe one quick question. Then. Uh, so we don't assume any kind of similarity here. So all of this is without any hash of similarity. Uh, if you add similarity into this, you'll be trying to combine the generation two with generation five. So throwing additional assumption, narrowing down the class of functions, and then I would expect there will be uh, even better results. All right. Thanks again, Peter. Thank you. So next we have Adi Rupa Saha, who is a research scientist at Apple Machine Learning Research. for the invitation firstly and uh, because uh, I don't uh, my background is mostly on online learning and optimization but um, I'm like really intrigued by the talks and the discussion that happened yesterday it's really like a, a very interesting field of work um, so in this work I'll talk about in this talk I'll talk about a joint work with Nati and uh, his students at TTIC uh, when I, I was visiting TTIC last year. So um, the work mostly addresses the problem of federated learning uh, with distribution shifts. And uh, one of the, so this is actually going to be published. This is, we are going to present it in ICML. So if you're around, we're happy to be talking to you again at ICML. Um, one of the disadvantage of giving a talk after Nati is uh, Whatever I will say, it will sound like a repetition, but I can't do much about it. So thankfully, Nati did not really mention so much about the heterogeneous model or the uh, fact of in the analysis about distribution shifts. So I'll start with a disclaimer. And Nati already mentioned that it is actually we don't understand much about this regime of the problem where we have this heterogeneous model or the stochastic distribution across the machines are different. Uh, we are actually trying to address an even more harder setup where the distributions are actually shifting across times. So starting with a disclaimer that no way we understand the complexity of the problem, the upper and lower bound very well. But uh, this is just a small stepping stone, uh, like a baby step towards defining the problem and understanding what could be a good comparator. So our results are not even close to optimal. And we are also very self-critical about it. But we would like to take your opinions about what is solved, what can be solved, what makes sense. So that's overall the stock is going to be. So uh, federated learning, of course, and also one more disclaimer for all the privacy folks present in this room. So we are not really addressing the privacy concerns here, but it is definitely something worth looking at also. OK, so uh, I don't think I need to actually give any motivating talk about how federated learning is important. We have already discussed a lot about it. Uh, so the only small thing I would try to mention here is of course, we know that in healthcare, 
recommender system, personal, uh, whatever, uh, autonomous driving, fraud detection, image detection, everywhere. Uh, this is very important. Uh, I mean, this, this has a huge application. Uh, however, uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, the distribution, so we have no reasons to believe that our, uh, so, so if our data, if the system is like, we want to make the system more personalized. If we have uh, our model deployed across this local machines, there is no reason to believe that the uh, function or the distribution uh, in this local machines are actually stationary. They might change over time. For example, in personalized recommendation, if you're trying to predict a movie to a user, there is no reason to believe that the liking of the movie, liking of the user is going to be same throughout the day or throughout the seasons. So there can be distribution shifts and definitely we should be talking about distribution shifts in federated learning. So that's the goal of this talk, but nowhere we are close to optimal or we have all the right answers here. Uh, these are just some motivations. I am not going to talk about all these slides here. So let's jump into the problem setup first. Okay, so the problem setup already was defined by Nati. So you have like M machines and each of its machines. So this is like mostly what has been considered in the prior works where we consider the homogeneous setup or even the heterogeneous setup. So you have some function which we try to minimize across the machine. So say capital F1 is the stochastic objective of machine one and so on F capital F. And uh, these are some stochastic functions. Um, there are some distributions which uh, are defining its functions, but these distributions are fixed across times. So uh, the local machines, whatever your system you have deployed in the local machines, they are playing some points or some models, say XTM at time T. So you are playing this game across T rounds for this capital M many number of machines. And the regret that we try to minimize or the objective or the performance measure that we try to minimize over this T rounds is essentially like be competitive. Whatever we are doing, whatever this XTMs, however this sequence of XTM is performing across all these machines. So let's compare its performance with the best possible model that you, you can have in the hand side. So definitely this is this is a very weak objective. This might not even make sense because this is not personalizing. This, this, this might not even make sense where we are talking about shifted distributions. But that's what we, ha we are going to talk about. Definitely there is room, room for improvement. And this is the problem set up that Nati already spoke about. So we are going to just generalize it a little more. So instead of assuming that all these functions have been sequence of functions being generated from a fixed distribution. Assume that this is actually generated for adversarial. So this is a very strong assumption. We don't need to assume that there is an adversary which is actually see, seeing the earlier function and your prediction and then generating the next function. But we are actually studying a very strong setup. We can actually definitely reduce the strength of this model and we can assume this FTs are smoothly changing or like FTs have enough relation across the time steps. All of those we need to discuss more. And I, I really appreciate your comment on that, if you have any comment, like how to make this model more realistic. So now we assume that at every time step t, the adversary or whoever, they generate a very adversarial function. That This can be an adaptive function. So the function is ft, ft1, ft2, ftm for m machines at time t. Again, the objective does not change much. So we want to be, we want to minimize our regret across all the machines uh, against a fixed comparator x star. So at least we should probably make it xm star instead of x star, but there can be more, more specific objectives we can look at. So we looked at this. Yes. Can I ask a, like a question? What part is changing over time? Is it the f's or the x's? X's. Fs are basically changing. This is like the model. So it is changing over time because uh, uh, the way the user is behaving with the system is as if changing. So that's what we are modeling the FTM. XTM is how we are reacting to the user, what we are predicting as a model to the user. So whatever the movie I'm recommending to the user, user or whatever, whatever recommendation system. So this is like my action as a learner. And this is like the user's behavior. Okay, so the, 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 the x that you choose will change, but it will change because the f is changing. Yeah, so I, I have definitely, yeah. It's like I'm trying to also, it's like an online process, so I'm trying to learn also uh, with different predictions. 
Okay, so that's the objective, and uh, you are very please be critical about the objective because we know this is not very optimal. Um, and we will be studying the intermittent communication model. So that you already mentioned about it. Um, so we will assume that how these machines are communicating. So the machines are generally not communicating. This local machi machines are separate, but only after every k rounds, the machines are allowed to communicate once. So that's the communication model. So we will call it the intermittent communication model. The way to, the hope to see is if we actually try to resolve this problem without any communication versus if we try to resolve the communication this problem with this communication, can we do something better at least at least in some of the regions? All right. So we need to have some sort of assumptions across some sort of regularity assumptions across the smart functions because um, yeah, there should be some relation across the machine. So the user behaviors has to be similar some way. So we have some set of assumptions, but they might not be very, again, realistic, to be honest. So the assumption number one is basically what we call the bounded second, bounded heterogeneity, first order heterogeneity assumption. We assume that there is, for every single point and every single time step, t, the, the gradient across the functions do not look very different. Okay, so we can definitely make it uh, relax assumption more. But this is one of the assumption we have. So we'll see this, whatever this boundedness, this zeta term is, our bound is going to depend on the zeta. And if the zeta is very small, that means the gradients across the functions are very similar. The machines are behaving very similarly. We will see an improvement in our performance. All right, what is the feedback model? I did not mention about the feedback model. So <laughs> I said that every user basically behaves with this the user or the environment is adversarial. So he behaves with his function f1, f1t, or whatever, ft, fti. But what you can query as a system or a learner is xtm. That's, that's suppose, a movie or, or a point in your decision space. So as a learner, you play a point in the decision space. What you see is not the gradient, but you see only the evaluation of the function in that point. So say I show you a movie, you tell me, like, what do you, how much you rate the movie in a scale of zero to 10, something like that. So that's why we call it a banded feedback. And then obviously we have this intermittent communication. Uh, so how to solve this problem? All right. Uh, the first thing to try is, we can just try some local best lines. So just, just try to be locally optimal. And let's see how does that perform. So what does that mean is you just don't care about the communication. You run your local bandit convex optimization algorithms in each of these machines. And this highlighted part is something you can choose your favorite bandit convex optimization routine here. So I can choose whatever my Flaxman Kali McMahon method or more sophisticated methods that came out later. But wait a minute, this, none of these methods depend on M because obviously these are, they are doing all parallel, parallel processing, but they don't care about communicating their models. So it's independent of M, not good. The next thing we can try doing is very similar to this federated averaging kind of idea where you can start basically every model. Uh, uh, is there a pointer here? Is there? We have like one, one more minute. Okay. So in every uh, every machine can actually uh, play its own point xtm, and then uh, it will query something around around this wtm. That's basically the point it's playing because we are projecting, and uh, we can compute the one point gradient. There is a method to con compute one point gradient estimate from just uh, this bandwidth feedback. So we can compute the gradient, and uh, whenever we are not communicating then we can just do a local gradient descent update in the local machines. And when we are communicating, we can just average out. That's the federated averaging idea. Nothing, nothing more we are doing here. So um, the regret bound here looks something like this um, when we actually analyze this algorithm. So let's try to understand what is the implication of this. So let's try to understand first even a lower bound of this problem. Uh, suppose if all the functions are similar, the functions are not even changing across times, and all the functions are actually drawn from the same distribution. So then this entire regret objective actually boils down to a stochastic bandwidth convex optimization problem for empty many number of rounds. And the lower bound for that is something like GBD square root empty. 
T is Kr. So can we actually be competitive with this rate? Because this is kind of the very loose lower bound. But this is this is something definitely a lower bound. Uh, turns out that whatever the baseline we use, that is definitely very not at all competitive. Uh, our algorithm could be competitive for a certain regime where D is very large. But obviously, and, and the noise is quite small because we have a noise term here. If the noise is small and our D is sort of, sort of, sort of large enough, then we could be competitive with the, this rate. But definitely, this indicator term that we have here is not optimal. We, there should be, we should be able to improve this term anyways. Okay, so I'll just take 30 more, 30 more seconds. Uh, so there are clearly, clearly hope for improvements. And we also tried a slightly different model here. This is not, nothing much different. So instead of querying one point, I can give you a way to query a relative feedback. For example, you can choose two movies. And you can tell me that how much you prefer a movie over the other. So if you can query two points, x1 and x2, you can uh, user would give me the difference of the function values. So with this, I can use a similar algorithmic idea. And with two point feedback, I can have a slightly better gradient estimate. So the rate improves a little bit. So whatever was D becomes square root D, and some terms vanishes here. But other than that, <coughs> similar problems more or less exist even in the in setting. Uh, so that's about it. And there are many open questions with Nati already talked about. We just don't know what should be a good comparator here, how to model the regularity across of the functions across the machines and across time. And uh, what, what is even a better communication model? Should we communicate after M rounds or only communicate when, the, when we actually believe that the model is not good? So it should be more active communication. And again, enduring privacy for another business also. So, big so thank you so much. I think in the interest of time, we might take questions offline. And maybe Musharraf can come set up um, just so we don't get too, too far off schedule. I think um, this is the last talk of the session. So uh, Musharraf Chaudhry from University of Michigan uh, will be giving this last talk. And let me. <laughs> Okay, can you guys hear me? Okay, thank you so much for inviting me. Like, uh, all the things that I heard is very fascinating, but they're all quick to me. I mean, in addition to the Greek symbols, like everything is <laughs> Greek. Um, so to get started, uh, like I'm not going to talk about sort of the actual part about research. We've been working on what is now called federated learning before the name federated learning existed. We called it geo-distributed analytics, uh, planet scale computation and so on. So that's why we never overlapped. And eventually I found that people are calling it federated learning. Then we started using that then I think I know uh, these folks found me. Um, so it's mostly led by my student fan and my colleague Harsha and a lot of students over the years uh, and many collaborators in academia and industry. And we have written a lot of papers in uh, dealing with systems aspects of communication, storage, computation, orchestration, uh, running on the device, running in the cloud, aggregation, and so on and so forth. But uh, after doing all these things uh, in early 22, end of 21, sort of some folks in LinkedIn, they, I don't know, read one or two of our papers, then they asked us to come and, I don't know, give a talk and sort of asked about, okay, they are thinking about implementing um, cross-device federated learning. They also have projects on cross-silo and so on and so forth. And everything I'm going to discuss is my understanding of whatever they are doing, not necessarily what LinkedIn actually is doing or want to do. So why they care about LinkedIn? I mean, there are some example applications that we always see, but these are sort of very concrete three use cases that they had in mind, like in terms of uh, ad and search. These are sort of screenshots of my LinkedIn app, and uh, they want to be able to re-rank the ads that are being shown so that the quality improves. And even for the search results, after the search results have been created and come into my app before they are displayed, they want to train a model that will re-rank 
based on my private features and so on. And also, especially the messaging part is sort of, I don't know why everything is like that. I don't understand, but uh, I don't know whether anyone can see clearly and it just looks very broken here. But in any case, uh, the messages are end-to-end -end encrypted and they want to train this uh, spam and phishing detection model on encrypted messages by training them on the device without having to collect sort of whatever messages the members are sending back and forth. And uh, they care about privacy and security, but uh, the other thing they cared about is also sort of uh, not much I've heard about is performance and cost, like to be able to uh, use signals that can actually lead to very timely changes. That's where all of the re-ranking parts comes in. Um, and also in terms of cost, of course, like if you could distribute work and instead of using a lot of GPUs, you can reduce the number of GPUs you need. That will be, I don't know, cost effective that may allow people to try out many more different models uh, potentially. And of course, like we analyze a lot of traces and data sets and whatever, there is all of all sorts of heterogeneity that we have heard too much about. They are all happen to be sort of tied together for an individual user. They have a specific data, specific type of device, specific availability pattern, and they are not really independent. So everything has to be considered together. But the part as a systems researcher, I found very interesting, actually even for me was very surprising is the usability of the system is much more important and trumps everything else because there are sort of many different stakeholders and we have to make sure that the users of the app, they feel like the experience they are having did not become worse, probably improved. Uh, the app developers, which is another set of people who are developing the app, they are trying to make it really snappy. Their uh, sort of expectation is that whatever computation, whatever is happening is not going to make things slow. So they don't have to go back, go back and rerun and re-optimize the app. And the ML developers who are designing sort of models, they already have a lot of tool chain and workflow. They don't want to go back and redo and rewrite everything from scratch. So they want to use all of the existing tool chain. So they thought about fit scale because it's sort of like a, a platform where you can simulate, but you can also sort of um, actually run the same code in a distributed fashion. You can plug in sort of data traces and system traces and different types of model, which all of the plots that I plotted earlier, they were collected by LinkedIn and they could plug in their own data to quickly simulate and see what is expected to happen. And they wanted to evaluate sort of many different ways of training, many algorithms, optimizers, quickly without having to actually deploy them. Because once you deploy, people notice and uh, it's sort of very risky and you have to quickly get a sense of how much resource and what type of performance you expect and so that they can plan. And so that is sort of one of the big thing. And here a quick segue to what uh, FedScale uh, is, is sort of a collection of a lot of data sets that goes beyond sort of the common data sets people use. Some of them are much larger uh, with uh, millions of clients and also the runtime itself is pretty scalable and fault tolerant so you can run on these uh, sort of data sets in a scalable fashion so that's where they started and i don't know whether you notice and i'm going really quickly so feel free to I don't know, eventually stop me and ask questions is that some of the data set they wanted to i don't know train on were like 16 million uh, sort of population and so it's like massive and you need a um, runtime that can i don't know scale and actually work uh, efficiently. So the other part is this, they already have this cloud ML platform, which they have built over maybe, I don't know, a decade. And all of the pieces, we don't have to go over all of it is like, I don't know, people know. It's just that they want this Flint, which is the federated part, FL integration in uh, LinkedIn, has to coexist with this thing. It cannot exist separately because people don't want to maintain two systems. People don't want to learn two different things. And the other part of Flint, which actually is not in this MLC's paper, um, is uh, sort of, it will be provided as a service where their first party apps are going to use federated learning, but they will also create an SDK that will be exposed to sort of their downstream customers, which are not really uh, sort of the users, but rather so that they can also do federated learning and analytics potentially, depending on how things have been set up. So it's sort of like actually building federated learning at a service where all of the clients are sort of like compute devices that are distributed potentially again. Um, and that is uh, used by completely sort of um, outside third parties to build their app, integrate in their app to run computation and uh, learn knowledge about it. Sort of you can think of it's akin to like cloud, but it's a, I don't know, this federated type of cloud. 
And so uh, for all of these three use cases, they, I don't know, did some simulation in this, I don't know, platform and our evaluation on the actual data set and actual traces. And they found that it actually performs pretty well, even with federated learning, the performance is within 2% of whatever fully centralized cloud training they are doing. There are a lot of details in the paper that I would not want to talk about. One of the things I want to highlight is that, which we also didn't do when we were doing FedScale and we didn't think of, is that they use this um, sort of, uh, they build a subsystem which relies on the AWS uh, device farm, where they have like bunch of many different mobile devices and browser, which typically uh, UI UX people use to test like how their mobile whatever apps and whatnot will look like in variety of devices, but they actually use that to run these many different sort of small models that they plan on actually deploying on the device and uh, train them or run a few iteration and then actually see like what type of performance and memory requirement and CPU requirement, so on and so forth. You can see those with the build up a sort of very nice infrastructure where you can submit a model and it will go and run on these 27 or however many different types of devices. You will collect all the stats. So you will know, okay, maybe this model is too big and it's probably not going to run on 33% of the phones. And this model is, I don't know, maybe uh, like actually small enough and can run within whatever constraints have been set by the ML, uh, sort of the app developers. But maybe the accuracy of the model, which is coming from the other side, is poor. So you need to consider all of these different multifaceted constraints and then come up with a solution what can be done. So I'm going to stop here. And the main lessons I learned is that like I didn't know about like all of these different types of people, even as a systems researcher, that the app developers and the ML developers and you know, their sort of the PMs they have like very different things that they care about and convincing everybody is extremely hard. Like uh, we've been, I don't know, I mean, at this point it's more than a year, it's moving slowly. That's why it's toward and it's not really, I mean, in production yet. So a lot of steps we have gone through and there are a lot of things to go through and more than sort of even theoretical guarantees, people care about sort of understanding what is going on just so when things break, they can try to explain or who to blame. I think it's very important. And also I, having some sort of predictable behavior is also very important. That doesn't necessarily mean like, I don't know, theoretical results are not useful. It's just that, uh, I mean, people who are actual engineers, they either don't understand or don't really have time to even appreciate. They just want, I know, like, this is their day job. So they have to you know, keep going to the next day and they just want to make sure the things are learning. And uh, FL or collaborative learning, whatever we're going to call it, uh, has to probably coexist with cloud uh, for a while, if not forever. And so it is probably going to be a combined version of two. There is no competition between this versus that. It's probably going to be this and that. And uh, I'll stop there. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I don't know whether I was too fast. Or... That was great. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you. I think you probably, I think you budgeted yourself for a question. Yeah. I could. So you talked about this uh, as, well as, a, as an SDK uh, yeah. for developers. Uh, can you, can you tell us a little bit about LinkedIn? Like, who, who would use it? Uh, like, who are LinkedIn's downstream customers? You talked about third-party people. Yeah. Who are the third-party? So, I mean, right now, they already have an SDK where uh, sort of all the different types of data they collect from their users that are sort of available for these different providers, maybe ad networks. Uh, maybe uh, no, people who are trying to run a campaign on LinkedIn, but they want to understand doing some analysis and analytics on what type of people doing whatever so they can better target their ad campaign and a variety of other things. I don't really know like all the business details of whatnot. And, and again, this is my understanding of what is there, but not necessarily whatever is actually going on. But my understanding is that they ideally, if possible, like uh, to move as much as possible in a very distributed setup, if they could make sure that it will be fully private and it's fully secure. So that's why privacy and security are very important, especially when you uh, allow third party people to uh, program against and train on and understand user data. So, I mean, all of the parts also are sort of pending, like where they are very confident that no one can actually extract things out. And also like designing the interface itself and what type of computation can or should or should not be allowed. There's a lot of research to be done. I think just from a basic systems perspective, like how to limit and restrict so people cannot do more than what is enabled. So just like general purpose computation 
probably is not a good idea. So it has to be very restricted, limited set of operations that are performed and may not even be learning for third party. It could be just analytics, just trying to understand certain things of distribution and not just an arbitrary computation that may actually slow down the app, which will actually hurt uh, LinkedIn app itself. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe one, one quick question and then we'll... I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like, what your measure of success is. Like, is being within 2% of a, the cloud ML algorithm, that's that's a win because we save money and we don't have to train on the cloud. Is success mean, oh, we should be able to use private features and be 2% better or 5% better? Like, how do you... I mean, it depends on sort of uh, whether it's 2% worse or 20% better. It remains to be seen because this is assuming, like, in a world where a lot of things are being collected. And I think the preparation is for the day where the cookies will be banned and app tracking is already closed and many other regulation may come out. And five years later, then whatever we are saying two person worse is actually probably 20% better because nothing is, I mean, the things that people would are like, I mean, gotten used to collecting. Um, so it's, it's unclear because it's, it's unclear what will become unavailable and how much that will affect like today's centralized ML, I don't know, accuracy. Uh, but I mean, as long as it's within the ballpark of whatever is happening today, it seems reasonable because you haven't all, I mean, 2% is actually very big. It's not really small. So it, 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 it's not, I, I, I wouldn't uh, make any, I don't know, business call myself on this. Uh, it's just that uh, at least like, um, it was not so bad that they would think that, okay, let's not, not even bother about it for a few more years and wait and see. I think 2%, I mean, they were expecting probably even more. And uh, when we had 2%, it seemed like everyone, including people higher are pretty excited that it's like pretty close. And uh, even if you lose certain signals, if you can, I don't know, be within 2% or whatever it is immediately. And of course, things will improve. There's that hope as well. Um, they'd be happy to have that. All right, thanks again. Uh, so we're gonna take a 10 minute break. So we can come back for the working group session around 11.25.